Well, thank you, Frank, for this nice introduction, and uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, thanks to uh, the Department of Modern Languages and the Memory Group for sponsoring this event, uh, and especially to Monica for organizing, being the brain behind all this organization. She thinks she's very disorganized. I've never seen somebody as organized as Monica, but uh, that's how it works. <coughs> The field of memory has become a crucial topic of inquiry across academic disciplines and social discourses in recent years. Andreas Hussen has referred to the widespread, quote, obsession with memory and fear of forgetting, unquote, in our contemporary globalized culture. The current preoccupation with collective memories across the globe and the parallel proliferation of critical discourses about the social processes of coming to terms with the collective past appear symptomatic of cultural anxieties resulting from the uh, systemic transformations caused by forces of globalization. I would like to argue that this resurgence of memory in political, cultural, and academic discourses in the age of globalization is not a mere coincidence, but a consequence. As Aleda Asman and Sebastian Kondra have noted, the traditional spaces, channels, and forms of collective memory are being transformed by and in reaction to the forces of globalization. Local and national spaces and processes of remembrance have not disappeared, but the global has now become the central stage for social and political actors, grassroots movements, and judicial activism. And that is why it has become necessary, thus rephrasing Maurice Holbach's conceptualization of the social frames of memory, to examine the global frames of memory, of memories in plural. I will start with uh, an act of remembrance. Uh, in the spring of 2010, uh, the news of Spanish uh, star judge Garzón, Baltasar Garzón, being indicted by Spain's High Court made the headlines of uh, news media across the globe and filled social um, networks, blogs, and websites of human rights organizations grassroots groups and civic associations throughout cyberspace. Judge Garzón had started investigations on the human rights violations, atrocities and forced disappearances occurred during the Spanish Civil War and the years of the Franco dictatorship, following international legal principles signed by Spain which cover crimes against humanity, until he was forced to stop by the National High Court. Um, in one of several paradoxical ironies, Garzón had been accused of acting without jurisdiction in a lawsuit filed by far-right organizations, including the Spanish Fascist Party, the Falange, which is considered responsible for the largest number of atrocities committed during and after the Spanish Civil War. The overwhelming response um, in support uh, of Judge Garzón was global, coming from heads of state, dignitaries, uh, Nobel Prize winners, as well as uh, NGOs, HROs, and grassroots community uh, groups across the world. The memories of those atrocities did not belong anymore to one single group or nation, but belonged to the larger transnational community. They were, quote, memories without borders. Um, so in what follows, I would like to examine the parallels and connections between the efforts uh, to recover historical memory in post-dictatorial societies, the formation of transnational memories, and perhaps its future convergence in the emergence of uh, that elusive uh, universal jurisdiction. So I will start with uh, um, a little bit of uh, reframing of the historical memory and forgetting in post-Franco Spain. The Spanish transition, capital T, uh, from dictatorship to democracy has been often presented in both academia, in, excuse me, in both academic and media discourses as the paradigmatic model of a peaceful, successful transition and rapid transformation into a modern democracy as an exemplar for other nations coming out of dictatorial regimes, particularly in Latin America in the 1980s and in Eastern Europe in the 1990s. The experience of the Spanish transition the replacement of the dictatorial regime by a democracy without the violence of war or revolution was at the time, in the mid-70s, practically without precedent in modern history. You have the two political transitions taking place more or less simultaneously in southern Europe, in Portugal and Greece, 
were characterized by uh, violent radicalization and the use of revolutionary force in the overthrow of the old regimes, in both um, through the direct intervention of the military and civil um, politics. The consolidation of democracy in both instances was delayed because of that. Uh, the Spanish model of a peaceful transition negotiated among the political elites was a new strategy, uh, that what's called the transition through transaction, which resulted in the relatively fast stabilization of the nascent democracy. At the same time, it started a virtually unexplored process of decentralization of the nation state and political devolution with the recognition of the internal multicultural and multilingual historical reality of Spain. These events made the Spanish transition a successful example, if not a model, at least an obligatory reference for other post transitional processes. In spite of this grand narrative of the Spanish transition uh, as an overwhelming success story, which in fact has become a foundational myth of Spanish modernity, there are uh, some serious shortcomings inherent to the process of Spanish democracy which cultural critics and historians have noted in hindsight, in particular the way of dealing with the past, or perhaps of not dealing with it. The politics of memory of the transition have been re repeatedly described as the erasure and the eradication of historical memory and the forgetting and silencing of the past. While well, that perception is based on the official pact of forgetting, brokered by the political elites, and it, in general terms is accurate, I would like to raise a few points for consideration of the role of memory uh, during the transition. One is that we should take into account the asymmetry of memories across the national geography. The atrophy of memory in the national political discourse was parallel to the recovery of historical memory in the peripheries of the nation state, where local forms of substate nationalism relied heavily on a different set of collective memories. A major component of the recognition of cultural and ethnical difference of the so-called historical nationalities and their demands for political rights was historical memory. The emphasis, however, was not, was not on, on preparations or backward-looking justice, but in the restoration of uh, pre-Civil War local institutions of government uh, and statues of uh, autonomy, particularly for Catalonia, the Basque Country, and Galicia, which had been cut short by Franco's uprising against the Republic. The second point is that memory and forgetting are not a simple either-or phenomenon, since memory always necessarily involves forgetting. And, quote, forgetting is full of memory, as Uruguayan writer Mario Benedetti has stated. El olvido está lleno de memoria. As a corollary of that, I would argue that historical memory did not completely evaporate during the transition either. It may have disappeared from the surface of political debates, but left noticeable traces uh, and remained operative in other areas of them, uh, on the margins of power. Memory was exiled uh, from institutional political discourse and displaced to the intellectual and cultural arena, where it found a distinctive space, as attested by the explosion of, in the early years of the transition, in the mid 70s, uh, late 70s, of literature, documentaries, films and historical and testimonial accounts dealing with the recent past, and the wide uh, public recognition of those works. Um, th these uh, works were uh, box office hits and won uh, a lot of prizes. Uh, works by Martin Gaite, Jorge Semprún, Vázquez Montalbán, Manuel de Nietzsche, etc., etc. And, and the fact that these works became popular uh, bestsellers and box office hits um, indicates that historical memory still resonated strongly with large segments of the Spanish public, no matter what the political elites had decided be behind closed doors, and that a significant memory void still needed to be filled. A third point. Uh, as Paloma Aguilar has argued, the memory of the past was not only present, but constituted a key factor in the particular development of the Spanish political transition only as a negative force. The hunting of the past was behind the calculated policy of not reopening um, uh, old wounds to avoid the repetition of national confrontation and violence. The fear of destabilization and potential repetition of a civil war conflict acted as deterrence uh, against a direct confrontation with the past, since that past was considered highly divisive. 
the traumatic memories of, and the, of the horrors and atrocities of the Civil War were constant reminders of the potential dangers of a violent reenactment of the past and influenced the collective will against seeing its repetition and therefore acted as incentive towards the politics of consensus. If one of the fundamental lessons learned from historical memory is the avoidance of the repetition of the mistakes of the past, <clears throat> it can be argued that the process of the Spanish transition had learned important lessons from its past, as well as of its neighbors, and therefore we should consider that memory of the past may have had a more important role in the transitional process than generally it is given credit for. Also, I would like to add another correction to the standard and official narrative of the exemplary Spanish transition. Although it is generally remembered as a peaceful process and as the victor of consensus and moderation over confrontation, the first crucial years of the political changes took place in a climate of violence and the threat of political involution did not dissipate until in the 1980s. Um, and we all, we all know that there was um, violence coming from both extreme ends of the political um, arena, both the ultra right and the uh, terrorist groups in the in the far left, and uh, in, in particularly Grappo and Aneta. So the official narrative of the Spanish transition forgets the, the violence and intensity of the conflicts and the real possibility of a successful coup. Several well were attempted. Uh, and most famously, the failed attack on Congress in February 23rd, 1981. But this violent, real, this violent reality had a profound effect on the way of dealing with the past. In an effort to make progress with the democratic reform and the stabilization of the new democracy, the political elites, both the regime reformists and the main leaders of the anti-Franco opposition agreed to use the discourse of the times not to reopen the uh, old wounds of the past or to turn the page and focus on the task of building the future in what became known as the collective pact of forgetting uh, or pact of silence about the past. In this negotiation, a performance of symbolic reconciliation of the elites, everyone conceded. The system reformist accepted the dissolution of the regime, the old regime, the full democratization of the state the legalization of political parties and release of political prisoners. The leftist anti-Franco opposition sacrificed the memory of repression and suffering in its 40-year collective struggle, reversed the long-standing republicanism, and accepted the legitimacy of the monarchy and parliamentary liberalism in exchange for freedom and democracy. So everybody really uh, had to give up uh, a part of its memory in order to uh, move ahead. <clears throat> As a result, historical memory was institutionally disavowed. It was problematic, messy, dangerous, and did not benefit the principal actors of the, emergency, of, of the emerging democracy. Both sides had skeletons in the closet, literally, <clears throat> and everybody had something to lose. Um, it was inappropriate to remember that the majority of the players on the right and the center of the political spectrum uh, particularly those in the party in government, had just started their careers as part of Franco's last administration, such as Prime Minister Adolfo Suárez. And for the uh, main uh, national parties of the left, the socialists and the communists, the past was also an inconvenience. Their legalization by the government was the result of a tacit agreement that they would not seek reparations. It was also in their best interest not to revisit the murky political responsibilities for their own atrocities committed on the Republican side during the Spanish Civil War. Historical memory became thus a political taboo in the Spanish political culture. The pact not to deal with the crimes of political nature committed during the Spanish Civil War and its aftermath during the 40 years of uh, the regime would result in the amnesty law of uh, October 1977 by which the newly elected representatives agreed on a general amnesty for all political motivated crimes committed since 1936, with the exception of the right-wing minority group Alianza Popular, which then became uh, Partido Popular, which refused pardoning the political crimes of the left. It should be remembered, however, that the main express goals behind the amnesty law approved was to officially pardon all of Franco's past political prisoners and exiles and to put an end to the judicial proceedings of those involved in political struggle against Franco, 
and thus to bring closure to the process of repression. Most Spaniards at the time ignored that, in actuality, the law also included two small articles uh, barring the prosecution of all political crimes committed since the Spanish Civil War on Franco's side, including post-war atrocities, forced disappearances, mass killings, and torture, all classified as crimes against humanity of international law. This fact did not receive the attention of the general media, which focused instead on the more pressing issues of the liberation and integration of political prisoners and the process of national reconciliation. A result of the amnesty law was that not only were those crimes never punished, they were not even investigated, and the victims did not receive justice and appropriate reparations, although gradual um, uh, reparations were subsequently uh, implemented throughout the years partially. While it can be argued that the amnesty policy was effective in stabilizing an emerging uh, and fragile democracy, and perhaps it was an inevitable measure in the context of an extremely challenging political and economic climate, in retrospect, it is clear that it created a severe ethical uh, deficit. More than a process of active reconciliation, perhaps impossible to achieve at the time, given the powerful presence of the old cadres in the military, the repressive forces, and the judicial structures, it was a disavowal of the past and the legal basis for institutional forgetting. And in that sense, political amnesty equaled historical amnesia. So amnesty and amnesia are the two concepts that go hand in hand in, in the transition. Um, perhaps some additional uh, context uh, would be required to understand um, this particular development now with hindsight that we have. Uh, since both the internal social pressures and the international environment were looking in a different direction. Although fundamentally a top-down project modeled by political elite, elites, backward-looking justice and accountability were not a high priority in the Spanish society as a whole, um, and were not part of the international climate either in the 1970s. The main social demands in Spain at the time were freedom, democracy, peace, and stability, with the addition of devolution aspirations from the peripheries. The Civil War and the worst atrocities in its aftermath had happened almost 40 years earlier, and the large majority of the Spaniards, of the Spanish population, 70% of it all, had had no direct experience of, of it, but only through indirect inherited memories or post-memories, as uh, Marian Hish has uh, coined. After 40 years of severe repression and the official erasure of conflicting memories of the past, the Spanish society was largely depoliticized and lacking in historical memory. In essence, there were not channels for public remembering and not enough collective desire to remember either. Spanish society embraced the new liberties and experience of modernity without much interest in remembering the sordid past. On the contrary, it actively tried to disassociate to disassociate from this past very rapidly. The generational change would set off the emergence of the movida and this intense live the moment, forget about the past attitude, which would be uh, an illustrative result of this phenomenon. It is also not surprising that a key symbolic figure who reappears forcefully in the cultural narratives of the transition and the movida years is the transsexual or the transvestite an ambiguous figure who embodies a past that needs to be forgotten, and a present that is constructed as a series of continuous acts of performance, in fact, often literally in transition. I should add that although the main factors of uh, transitional processes are internal to the nation, the international historical context can play a very significant role as well. The international climate in the mid-70s as a result of Cold War politics had more tolerance for undemocratic regimes, and a lot less interest in persecuting human rights violations. So it's a very different um, moment in history. There was not a strong international pressure to accountability, human rights organizations were not fully developed, and the battle against impunity was not a major motivation, as would be the case more uh, in the 1980s and 90s. In this climate of collective forgetting, uh, cultural critics have referred to a crisis of memory, and different interpretive models have been employed. While many Spanish writers, artists, film directors, and all the cultural figures have grappled with these issues in their works, they all point out to a big void in the Spanish collective memory 
thousands of victims of Franco's brutal repression remain forgotten or unknown. To the new generation of Spaniards, Franco was soon just as forgotten and irrelevant as Napoleon, uh, dismissed as inconsequential for the present, and the atrocities committed during and after the Spanish Civil War were largely ignored. Official school programs and textbooks hardly made any reference to the war or to the dictatorship, and the Valley of the Falling, the colossal mausoleum erected by Franco as a war memorial of the victorious side, and constructed with the forced labor of 20,000 Republican political prisoners, is regularly, or has been regularly being visited by thousands of tourists, uh, unaware of its dark history, which is not even mentioned by the official guides. Um, this ethical deficit uh, has been summed up by Spanish writer Almudena Grandes, who said, quote, the democratic transition was a success from the point of view of institutions because it allowed the most solid democratic period enjoyed by the country. Yet, from a moral point of view, it was not a success because a generation later, we Spaniards cannot accept the deficit of that process. So with this, I move now to the second part uh, of the lecture, uh, talking uh, about transatlantic mirrors and asymmetries. So after this presentation, can we still talk about a model transition and its application to other transitional processes? I wonder. The idea of a model implanted and replicated in other countries is highly problematic and ultimately probably false. The internal di uh, dynamics of each country are very different and there is a general agreement that although international factors can play significant determinant, uh, can be significant determinants, it is above all internal factors that determine the process of a democratic transition. And also the efforts of exporting democracy have met with relative failure when not huge disaster. So perhaps we should not see the Spanish transition as a model handbook, uh, but just as a reference uh, from where lessons both positive and negative could be learned. And ultimately, rather than the single exemplary model with different applications, it would be potentially more instructive to see a plurality of different national examples and experiences acting as potential mirrors, where each one of the participants has looked and learned from each other different ways of dealing with the past in a sort of transatlantic boomerang effect. And I would like to point out several uh, transnational connections which would support this theory of mirrors and um, rebound effects. One, the disappearing of Franco's regime, which had not been, if not exactly a model, at least an important reference point for Latin American military dictators, from Trujillo uh, in the Dominican Republic to Pinochet in Chile. Seeing the dismantling of the dictatorship in Spain um, and Spain's overall successful transformation into a democratic society was a sign of hope and encouragement for those seeking the return of democracy in Latin American countries. Spain became also a major uh, refuge for many political exiles from the Southern Cone in particular, in a boomerang reversal of the massive Spanish Republican diaspora after the Spanish Civil War. As a result, valuable transnational cultural connections were established and mutual learning was attained through actions of solidarity, practices of resistance, and experiential exchanges about ways of dealing with the past. Collective memories were shared and new memories were made. Two, the Spanish transition experimented with new political strategies, uh, the route of political reform through peaceful negotiation rather than violent overthrow or revolutionary action. This would be the general roadmap follow, followed in most Latin American political transition processes, negotiated transitions, where reform by political force was chosen over rupture. This commonality of experience explains the frequent use of a common lexicon, transition, pact, historical memory, and desencanto. These are all uh, well, disillusionment with uh, unfulfilled dreams and expectations. These are recurring concepts in the historical and cultural narratives of the Spanish and Latin American post-dictatorships, which signal towards shared memory discourses. But there are also important differences. The Latin American transitions of the Southern Cone in particular employed new forms of social action and adopted a new language of human rights that were initially absent uh, in the Spanish case. In essence, the Latin American transitions introduced new forms of dealing with the past, 
through the establishment of uh, truth commissions, official reports, and judiciary tribunals to investigate, document, and prosecute the human rights violation of the past. This phenomenon is perhaps the most significant difference with respect to the Spanish transition. As we have seen, in the Spanish case, there was a significant lack uh, of uh, trials, tri tribunals, and other acts of investigation and retribution in dealing with the past. In sharp contrast, thousands of cases of forced disappearances and other crimes against basic human rights were documented in Argentina and Uruguay, Brazil and Chile, and a few made it into the court system. In many, of, in many of those cases, however, those early efforts would bring few successes and, like in Spain, eventually would be excluded from prosecution due to different amnesty decrees passed and newly enacted laws of full stop or due obedience as a result of the pressures of the uh, military and the changing political climate, such as the presidential par uh, pardon by Carlos Menem in 1990, later annulled, and so it, it's, it's been a much more complicated process. There were also uh, new social actors uh, at work in Latin American transitions thanks to uh, grassroots uh, mobilization and thus the important role of human rights organizations, indigenous communities, movements and family of victim associations such as the Madres uh, de la Plaza de Mayo, a non-partisan uh, political organization that would obtain worldwide recognition and would serve as an example for all the human rights civic associations in different countries, including Spain. There was also a new vocabulary, uh, foremost desaparecidos, uh, allegedly first used in Guatemala in 1966, but infamously employed by the Argentinian armed forces and subsequently adopted by human rights organizations and victim associations. The concept of desaparecido, or forced disappearance, gained wide international acceptance in discussions of human rights and moving across borders eventually would be employed retroactively in the Spanish context. Thus, a double time space displacement occurred by which a concept of the second part of the 20th century imported from Latin America is applied retroactively to events of the first half of the 20th century in Spain. Although most scholars uh, agree that it is internal tensions and agents that are of primary importance in transitional processes, regional, transnational, and international influences also play a role. And so I would like to underline the different international time space context the 1970s Cold War and the 1990s post-collapse of the Soviet bloc, which convey different international implications and solutions. Spain's closer proximity to other established European democracies and the assistance received from European political institutions, parties and unions facilitated that uh, peaceful transition and, uh, and assisted with the rapid um, process of political and economical stabilization. The Cold War international setting did not favor accountability measures and human rights uh, efforts. But the mid and late 1980s, uh, 1980s, the obsolescence of dictatorship was beginning to be widely recognized as the example of the Iberian transitions had shown. The new international situation with the crisis and breakdown of the Soviet bloc and the end of the Cold War acted also as catalysts to reopen the past, to learn what had happened in Eastern Europe, for example. And this facilitated the human rights efforts. The War of the Balkans and the genocide in Rwanda in the early 80s were also major boosts to human rights awareness and plans to action on a global scale that did not exist earlier. And this would determine the creation of UN-directed supranational tribunals specifically designed to deal with atrocities committed in, in both countries, important uh, precedents for the implementation of a universal jurisdiction. The Latin American transitions were influenced by this new international climate to reopen the past and demand justice. In this context, a question just presents itself. Did these events affect the way of dealing with the past in Spain, and how? Or, or did it all come too late, in the Spanish case? So I'll come now to the third part. Uh, Judge Garzón and the globalization of justice. In the last years of the 20th century, a new global paradigm emerged. The end of the Cold War era opened the possibility of establishing this uh, international jurisdiction, a concept that appeared after World War II, but had been dormant since the Nuremberg trials. Several elements came together unexpectedly. The fact that there was a certain vacuum in the international enforcement of um, human rights violations, and the particularity of the Spanish legal system, which grants investigative powers to judges, and a universal jurisdiction statute that allows crimes against humanity to be tried in Spanish courts, independent of where they took place. 
Um, this, by the way, changed in 2009. So now only uh, allows cases um, when Spanish citizens are involved. But originally, um, it could apply to anywhere in the world. The international climate and the uniqueness of the Spanish legal system made Spain one of the few places where human rights crimes committed anywhere in the world could be heard in a court of law, which explains the emergence in the international arena of the figure of Baltasar Garzón, the well-known judge from Spain's high court, specialized in high-profile cases of national and international magnitude. That, and of course, his own um, uh, relentless drive and personality. Jessica Fon remains um, a highly controversial figure uh, still uh, at home, while widely recognized as a champion of, of the fight for human rights across the world and a major proponent of the concept of uh, universal jurisdiction. His ju judicial crusades against organized crime, terrorism, drug trafficking, state crimes, and in favor of victims of political violence and the rights of indigenous peoples have been widely recognized also well known is his involvement in the establishment of legal grounds for the trial of crimes against humanity in Latin America. Judge Garzón's international standing and reputation as human rights crusader gained greater prominence and visibility with the 1998 indictment against ex dictator Augusto Pinochet. Indeed, a historical precedent was set when Garzón requested Pinochet extradition to Spain uh, to stand trial for human rights abuses during a medical visit in the UK you all remember, I'm sure. The House of Lords admitted the request based on the principle of international jurisdiction and he remained under arrest for 16 months. The case received wide coverage across the world as a first test of the transnational application of universal principles of crimes against humanity on one of its most notorious figures, generally considered an untouchable. Human rights organizations, victim associations, and the political left in Chile, as throughout Latin America and many other parts of the world, celebrated uh, this uh, extradition, extradition. Conservative sectors were generally displeased. The Chilean government was embarrassed, and so was the Spanish, led by conservative leader José María Aznar, who thought the case would affect Spanish economic interests in Latin America. Although eventually the case was dismissed for medical reasons, it is generally acknowledged that it represented a major step ahead in the implementation of the concept of universal jurisdiction and the effort to fight cases against human rights violations worldwide. Dictators were not immune to prosecution. National amnesty decrees did not protect with impunity crimes against humanity. Human rights principles of international jurisdiction could be implemented transnationally. The effects of Garzón's indictment of Pinochet, legally and symbolically, directly and indirectly, cannot be underestimated. It gave renewed impetus to HROs and the efforts of undertaking accountability process in Latin America, enabling the reopening of stalled investigations and trials, and serve as precedent for many new cases that were filed in Spain and other countries. In addition, the process offered the opportunity to prosecutors, uh, HROs, NGOs, victims and civil associations, across geopolitical borders to learn from each other um, the successes and failures and to influence or supplement institutional measures. As uh, Roth Ariyatha has commented, quote, the transnationalization of human rights activist networks and the flow of knowledge through those networks have allowed different countries to learn from one another. The currents of globalization can be instrumentalized by progressive forces and affect the political elites, as also Asman and Conrad have stated, and I quote, the values of counter-globalization have invaded the hegemonic memory constructs of the nation state, and they have reasserted claims to moral comfort and accountability, end of quote. Peripheral counter-memories have thus come to occupy a central position in national and international political debates and social processes. These types of international and transnational experience with accountability processes have also proved viable for reparation measures and the establishment of truth commissions, for example. The Chilean model of dealing with the past was created in large measure from the lessons of its neighbors, going beyond Uruguay, who did relatively little, but falling short of Argentina, who did a lot more, but backfired. This experience in turn influenced the transitional process in other places, in South Africa, for example, with some modifications, including public hearings and reports, and no amnesty law passed. As the study of these global frames of memory indicate, a complex network of national and transnational groups, civic and institutional organizations, have been instrumental in the establishing of basic principles of universal jurisdiction.
supranational institutions such as the UN, the EU, or the OAS have generated human rights ordinances and treaties that oblige individual signatory countries, and these provisions have been used in court in individual countries. The UK and Chile had signed the Anti-Torture Treaty in 1988, and therefore the Pinochet case was accepted, accepted for torture crimes committed after that date. Recent international law ruled that crimes of forced kidnapping and disappearance are committed daily in the present as long as the victim remains disappeared, which in essence annuls the statute of limitations um, and opens the door for prosecution of many human rights violations. The Inter-American Commission of Human Rights determined that amnesties in Chile, Uruguay, Argentina, and El Salvador violate the principles of uh, the Commission. And these allegations have been employed as judicial argument, argumentation to reinitiate initiate investigations. Similar cases have occurred in reference to other international provisions with, with mixed results. And now I come uh, full circle to the fourth and last uh, part, and the boomerang returns home, as they do. <laughs> Several paradoxical ironies and asymmetries emerge from this narrative. While a Spanish judge was able to bring to trial criminals accused of crimes against humanity committed beyond the national borders, the war crimes, atrocities, tortures, mass execution, political persecution that occurred during the Spanish Civil War and the dictatorship on the Spanish soil remain unexamined. There is something fundamentally odd with the picture of Spanish courts pursuing human rights abuses committed by foreign dictators while they had been unable to investigate the much larger number of atrocities committed in their own land. This realization has not escaped the attention of uh, many intellectuals and writers and cultural critics in Spain uh, who have been relentlessly demanding the recovery of historical uh, memory in recent years. It was at the turn of the millennium, during the conservative government of the Partido Popular, um, led by Aznar, that, that grassroots community associations, non-governmental groups, and activists emerged with great force demanding a solution to this crisis of memory in Spain. Different sectors of Spanish society mobilized around the common goal of unearthing, literally, unearthing the past, uh, which literally had been buried during Franco and symbolically reburied during the transition. Because of the government lack of interest in pursuing investigations, the work relied on the efforts of civic associations, NGOs, or uh, sometimes uh, political organizations on the, on the left. <coughs> Community groups and family of victim associations started forming with the idea of reclaiming the identification of victims of Franco's repression and the recovery of the remains of the family members disappear and buried in unnamed mass graves across the land. These groups largely followed the example of grassroots movements and civic associations in Latin America on the margins of traditional power structures, the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo in particular. The creation of the Asociación para la Recuperación de la Memoria Histórica in 2000 was followed by a myriad of other civic associations across the land, many organized uh, within the Federación de Foros de la Memoria, which had placed memory back in the center of Spanish political life in recent years. Their claims struck a chord with the Spanish society, slowly awakening up to the reality of a brutal past of repression which had itself been repressed. The um, IRMH website logo captures the emotional side of repressed collective memories. Question, why did the fathers of the Constitution leave my grandfather on a ditch? Thousands of unmarked burial sites and ditches along the roads still remain in the Spanish landscape. Invisible, but ever-present, just like ghosts still awaiting their day, in justice, day of justice. The liminal and invisible position is an adequate metaphor for their non-existent status in the margins of official history. The best known internationally of those victims still disappear is the almost mythical figure of Federico García Lorca, a symbolic martyr of the Spanish fascist uprising, assassinated in the first weeks of the Civil War and still unaccounted for. Like a ghost, Lorca's shadow is a powerful reminder of the unsettled nature of the past and historical memory is still waiting recovery, resolution, and reparation. In addition to these efforts, new investigations undertaken after the reopening of official military archives to historians and documentarians reveal the existence of a large number of concentration camps where atrocities were committed on a large scale with absolute impunity, which had totally been erased from collective memory. 
uh, and several best-selling historical novels as uh, Manuel Rivas, El Lapiz del Carpintero, or Javier Cerca, Soldados de Salamina, Dulce Chacón, La Uz Dormida, Jesús Ferro, uh, Las Trece Rosas, many others, all of which have been adapted to, uh, to the cinema. I've been given depth of emotion and further explored the extent of political crimes during the war and its afterward for large audiences. The multiplicity of events, all these multiplicity of events, led to the new socialist government which came to power in 2004 to establish a special commission, Commission Interministerial para el Estudio de la Situación de las Víctimas de la Guerra Civil, presided by the deputy prime minister in the spirit of the investigative commissions that had been formed in many Latin American countries earlier. The Spanish Parliament declared 2006 as the year of memory and subsequently passed in 2007 the law of historical memory. This highly contested law, insufficient for some on the left and necessary for many on the right, officially declared illegitimate, illegitimate and radically unjust the legal practices and acts of violence used by the Franco regime against its political enemies. He gave reparations to the victims of political persecution and their families and eliminated the presence of political symbols and street names associated with Franco and his regime in all public places, at least on paper. Um, it also banned pro-Franco political rallies at the Valley of the Fallen, where Falange supporters have usually gathered around Franco's tomb every year for the last 35 years. It was also the express mandate of the law that local courts would assist with and facilitate the recovery and identification of disappeared victims of the repression, among other provisions. Although late and imperfect for some, the new law was a major victory for family members and, and, and victim, family members of victims. And now we're coming full, uh, back in full circle to the beginning. Several associations of victims filed a suit requiring a full investigation of several mass uh, graves with victims of Franco's political violence. In September 2008, Judge Garzón started preliminary general investigations of all the disappearances occurred during the Spanish Civil War and post-war dictatorship, reaching an estimate of 114,000 victims. In October 2008, he assumed the investigation of forced disappearances and mass executions in what would be known as the case against the crimes of Francoism. He ordered the digging of uh, 19 mass graves, including two highly symbolic ones. One in the Valley of the Fallen, uh, Franco's own mausoleum, where thousands of unknown Republican soldiers were buried, and one in Granada, where García Lorca remains were thought to be. As we can see, Garzón always looks for great visibility and projection for all his acts. <clears throat> Garzón requested the death certificates of of the alleged perpetrators in a move that was seen by many as trying to determine our responsibilities. The investigative process was initiated and mass graves were dug with the Partido Popular vociferously opposed about reopening the wounds of the past and the strong opposition of conservative um, sectors of the media, judicial bodies and the Catholic Church. The investigations and side diggings were interrupted when the prosecutor's office and the criminal branch of the National High Court with a, um, a conservative majority interpreted that Garzón did not have jurisdiction on the matter and the investigations were forced to stop almost as, as soon as they started. A month later, Garzón recused himself from the case and let the local courts proceed with the investigations. Since then, local courts and government, particularly those where the Partido Popular is in power, which is all of them, most of them, have been passive resistant uh, to the efforts in the recovery of victim remains. So he has been again up to the civic associations to do a job to do the job on their own. The digging of mass graves has continued across the national landscape. At least 2,000 mass burial sites have been located so far, and more than 3,000 individual victims um, identified and properly buried, thus bringing at last some form of closure um, for many. Uh, that's, this is almost the end, but not quite. <laughs> Three far-right political groups associated uh, with the old regime, including Falange, the Spanish fascist party, filed a suit against Garzón for uh, prevaricación, um, lack of jurisdiction. Um, based on a technicality, the discrete competence of lower courts versus the national high court, and the existence of the 1977 amnesty law. 
a varied uh, of long-time political and personal vendettas against Garzón, including rivalries with far-right judges and um, the political system, did the rest, with the result that the Spanish General Council of the Judiciary suspended Garzón from court uh, on May 2010 after his indictment for lack of jurisdiction. And then the judge subsequently requested the leave from the court and accepted a special consultant position at the International Crime Court um, in the Hague, the highest tribunal established on the premises of, a universal, uh, of universal jurisdiction. For Emilio Silva, the president of the Asociación uh, for the Recovery of uh, Sorda Memory, this move had the symbolism of a political refugee looking for asylum away from his homeland. And he has described Garzón as, quote, the last of Franco's exiles. Uh, the fact that he had to choose to, to move to a different country in order to continue um, living. Um, the case against Garzón made the headlines of news media uh, around the world, just like many of the cases he had overseen at, at, before. Massive demonstrations in Spain and international shows of support followed. One Catalan collective issued a manifesto of support precisely entitled for a memory without borders, which has been signed by thousands uh, around the world. The darkly ironic paradoxes surrounding this case have not gone unnoticed. While his work has been applauded by international observers, politicians, human rights activists, and the world media at large, at home he has been vilified and been the target of continued attacks in what for some has been the most shameful act of recent Spanish history. I think I, I need to rethink that because there's been so many shameful acts in recent Spanish history that there's just one more. <laughs> For many at home and abroad, it was more than just the reprieve of one individual judge, but a collective slap in the face of all the victims. As one devastated family member of a victim said upon hearing the indictment, she said, it feels as if they had won the war all over again. Uh, for most, it is incomprehensible that the judge who listened to and facilitated the demands of many seeking truth and justice for the disappeared family members would find himself sitting in the bench of the accused on account of a suit filed by the Spanish fascist party directly responsible for the largest number of atrocities committed during and after the war. And the Human Rights Watch representative Reed Brody denounced the double standard of the Spanish justice system that investigated the Argentinian and Chilean um, dictatorships, but indicted a Spanish judge for doing the same with the Spanish dictatorship. In another boomerang effect, a group of Galicians from Argentina filed a suit in Buenos Aires to reopen the case against the human rights violations of the Franco regime. Nora Cortinas, a member of the Madres de la Plaza de Mayo, noted the symbolic implications of this case as a way of repaying Spain in kind for the earlier opening of investigations about the desaparecidos in Argentina in Spanish courts. So this is con this continuing vulnerant effect moving back and forth um, across the Atlantic. The Garzón case ultimately has meant the return of the repressed with full force, the hunting of the ghosts of the past improperly buried, and has confirmed the unfinished business of the Spanish transition, especially when seen in contrast with all the transnational efforts to promote historical memory, human rights, and backward-looking accountability around the world. In a certain way, it was fitting that Garzón's own case would become the center of international attention and a president seeking trial, as many see this as the ultimate test of uh, universal jurisdiction in the fight against human rights abuses. Ultimately, Garzón's quixotic quest, quest of reparation of injustices and crimes against humanity around the globe illustrates the possibilities raised as well as the challenges presented towards the goal of universal jurisdiction and the eradication of impunity by the competing forces of individual nation states, transnational grassroots networks, and supranational organizations in the new global dynamics. But it also suggests the existence of networks of memory without borders, and the potential of those memories to make an impact on the global stage and change for the future. As former Director General of the UNESCO, Federico Mayor Zaragoza, has written, quote, the truth of exactly what happened must be revealed without limitations. Only through this collective memory, with a profound knowledge of the past, will, be, will we be capable of building the appropriate future for a common destiny. And we can only do so with memories without borders, with justice without borders. End of quote. End of talk. Thank you.
And now the, I throw the boomerang at you. <laughs> okay, can I just say thank you to Jose for a, a really fascinating talk that um, kind of extends the work that, that we know that he's done in other areas, and I, I think probably opens it up um, into the areas of people who are not kind of specialists in um, Hispanic studies. So I'm pretty sure you'd be happy to answer a few questions. I'll try to hide my ignorance about everything that I talked about. <laughs> um, I'm curious about the relationship between the Spanish language and the Spanish where we have a potentially mem a memory model, you know, we did this really well. Because coming from the German studies context, of course, this is something that's often said about Germany. And yep. um, so we we eventually confronted our Nazi past and we did it really well. And then we managed to apply these lessons when we confronted our East German past as well. So this this kind of and in both cases people can then point to the fact that actually it wasn't really a memory model and there were lots of problems. Yes. But with that in mind, I was wondering then, you mentioned the 1970s, end of the 1970s, when the decisions were being made to remember or not to remember. And in West Germany at that point was the supposed watershed of confronting the Nazi past with the television series Holocaust. Yes. And you know millions of West Germans particularly watching. So just at the very point that those decisions were being made in Spain, West Germany was supposedly, for the first time, obviously not, but supposedly coming to terms with the Nazi past. So I was wondering whether there was any kind of reflection on what was happening in that other past fascist context in Spain at that point, or whether these memory models weren't kind of transferring at that point, and it's only something that's been talked about later. Yeah. Um, that's very interesting. As, as, as I was saying, there is... Um, there is a combination of internal and external factors, and so each, each uh, country has its own dynamic, but at the same time it's influenced also by what's going on, particularly uh, in, its, um, in, in countries with a direct relationship, uh, political or uh, historical. And, uh, and so um, um, Germ Germany was a very strong influence in Spain and what was happening, uh, particularly because the um, um, the Socialist Party chose to follow the German model. I mean, Willy Brandt was a very, very strong figure there, because as you know, he fought in the Spanish Civil War. So uh, the, the Germany present was, was really there. To what extent um, the confrontation of, uh, of the past uh, that Germans uh, were doing at that time, and uh, the opposite, really, uh, in Spain, that's an interesting question, because uh, in that sense, we uh, in Spain were following the complete opposite uh, route of um, yes, there was uh, an unearthing of some past, but at the same time was an, a, a covering of it, at least at the political level. So maybe in Germany um, they were able to uh, to move from the cultural to the political arena and to actually discuss that. Whereas in Spain, uh, yes, uh, those materials were now available, and you could read about it, and you can watch documentaries. But at the political level, there was silence. Uh, there, there was no discussion of the past. I mean, that, that was kind of the pact. That was kind of, of the agreement, right? And that was really the consensus for the next uh, two or three decades uh, until this new paradigm uh, with the beginning, um, really with with, um, with the new millennium. Um, so it's 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 very interesting, right? That uh, we we are um, so close, and uh, and yet we we follow very different paths. Um, but I, I, I do think that though everything that is happening around has an influence, uh, but not necessarily that makes it to go in what particular direction. Um, and, and many times the, um, the presence, as I was trying to, to argue, the presence of the past also um, somehow conditions uh, political decisions, even though in the negative, let's not do that, right? So. It, it certainly is an element. Um, um, it's interesting that now Spanish historians, some Spanish historians, have been using the, the Holocaust uh, narrative and, uh, as an explanation of the Spanish Civil War. Uh, most recently uh, with the Spanish Holocaust. The book is titled Spanish Holocaust by um, um, Paul Preston. He's one of the most prestigious uh, Spanish historians in the world. He's uh, the principal historian's chair in, in London. Uh, London. Yes. Um, and um, some people, you know, think that this is inappropriate, that the word misused in a, a conceptual paradigm that somehow 
um, it's not appropriate. Well, that, there is a discussion going on about how far you can go in that direction, right? Um, the same thing that's happening in Latin, in Latin America. I've, I've heard uh, one colleague that has used that paradigm and there were hands raised in the audience like, you cannot do that in France, you will be killed. And <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think um, that um, as, as a discipline, as, uh, as history, historians, they, they, I think they, they tend to be very conservative in that sense to, to maintain uh, the territory um, um, of memory to some extent. So let's not confuse uh, our histories. Right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yes. Um, well, thank you, first of all, for really wide ranging and uh, quite nuanced um, presentation of the sort of memory debates in, in Spain and Latin America. Um, I, I would Wish to be, um, uh, I'd like to, to ask you um, about a, a difference that seems to me quite important but hardly mentioned in most analysis between the Spanish case or the situation in Spain and, and the situation in, in Latin American countries, especially in the major ones, you know, like Chile or Argentina, mm -hmm. Peru, and so on. <coughs> which is that um, in Spain, uh, those who have actually been subject to uh, Franquist uh, repression. Uh, and have been in prison and so on, uh, and m mostly uh, uh, members of the Communist Party. There was, for, for, for a long, long time, the only internal opposition to, to Francoism, um, had adopted, uh, it, was, it was official uh, sort of policy of the Communist Party since 1956, this kind of national reconciliation yeah. process. Yeah. And it was actually uh, 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 the leader of the um, um, Communist Union, Comisiones Obreras, uh, Marcelino Camacho, who had been imprisoned until the, the well into the 70s, uh, who, who actually um, advocated for, for a yes vote for the amnesty law in Parliament in 1977. Um, whereas in, uh, and there was, it is very difficult to see any sort of grassroots organizations like the Association for the Recovery of Historical Memory and so on at that time no, there wasn't. in Spain at all. Whereas in, in, in um, Latin American uh, instances, what you have is that the movement and the process towards democratization is actually triggered yeah. by that kind of grassroots activism. In my view, perhaps because the, the crimes and the atrocities are very, very recent. Right. And there is no temporal distance between uh, that activism. Um, I just um, wanted to know what, what you think of it. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. That I, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. We've, uh, we've um, both ex examples. Um, in, uh, it's true that the, uh, the Communist Party, which was the strongest uh, uh, party in, in the uh, anti Franco struggle uh, during the dictatorship, made a conscious move uh, towards reconciliation. That, uh, that meant we have to forget about the past. So they were the, the first ones who actually went in that direction, and eventually that was that became the hegemonic line, right? Um, um, and then when the when the left actually became uh, uh, the government, right, in 1982, that was the official uh, that, that became the official law. Um, so that explains the lack of, of sort of popular. Uh, activism and movement because there were nobody, no political structure behind it. Everybody was against it. So even though, yes, there was all these um, uh, cultural narratives that were being uh, unearthed, um, there, there was nothing was being done with that. Um, and so that uh, until very recently. And yes, of course, the, the, the sort of temporal distance uh, with the events, like as I was trying to explain, most of, of the atrocities were committed during the Spanish Civil War and in the immediate aftermath, you know, in the 1940s. But, you know, the majority of the population in, in, in the 70s had not been born even. Uh, so that, that distance, um, I think also because of the, um, the sort of the, um, of the economic uh, boom of the 1960s uh, had been a, a very important uh, a, a transformation in, in the Spanish society. Uh, and for a lot of people, uh, this is an argument that Paloma Aguilar has made, and I think she's quite right. Um, stability, economic stability, was very important uh, because now they have all, you know, all of the luxuries of, uh, of, of, of consumer society, and they have the cars, and they have the washing machines, and they, they were trapped into the comforts. 
So they really didn't have anything to fight uh, against because the, uh, pretty much they, they were um, at ease with uh, consumers. There is that element too, I think, that is a little bit different. Um, so is there a broad difference? But, uh, uh, but also, I, I think, um, the particular economic development that had uh, uh, been achieved, that, that acted as a sort of a stability uh, factor, and, and as a sort of, uh, well, let's not change this too much, because then we will go back to war and lose everything. Right? I think there's definitely a little bit of that also. Yes? I just wanted to ask you as well something about your personal view. It's something is is easy now. It seems easy now to talk about the transition. Now we are out of it, or recently out of it. But when you look back, would you say that that pact of silence was the necessary price, an obvious price for a peaceful transition, or do you think it was an unnecessary concession? Do you think, looking back, that it could have been different, or it? It actually, there was no other way of... It's a, it's, a, it's a big question. I think it's a question that a lot of people still ask themselves. And as I was trying to express, perhaps it was unavoidable. Uh, perhaps of all the possible options at the time, that perhaps was the best. So I'm not saying that was horrible. I'm saying it was imperfect. Oh, no. uh, I'm saying that it's not as great as uh, the official narrative tells us that it has been, you know. Because the, the transition is our best achievement. Uh, very recently, when the, the expo in Shanghai, the Minister of Spanish Culture uh, accentuated that uh, the, the, the Spanish transition is our biggest achievement in modern history. So uh, that narrative is very strong uh, still. Uh, it's like I was saying, it's the, the sort of foundational myth of the Spanish modernity is la transición, no? la movida, uh, combined with it, right? Um, so, uh, yes, it's it, it's a big question. Uh, it's going back to that, because maybe that couldn't be solved at the moment. No. You had to wait all these years. Yeah, uh, I, I think to a certain extent, because, uh, I mean, we, we, we tend to forget that uh, the violence of the transition. One thing, I mean, the instability, the, the sort of uh, unknown, um, there were no precedents of how to make a transition. So everything was new, to, uh, and so that was a, a chosen. I, I think the fact that it was a transition through transaction was positive. I, I think negotiation is better than confrontation, and, but it has a price to pay, right? You lose some. Uh, so I, I think there is a give and take in, in that. Having said that, I think with the recent developments in Spanish history, now we have perhaps a, a different view of the past now because we see the cracks of the system, right? Um, much more clearly. And so when there was abundance and the, when there was uh, yeah, a time of richness, uh, perhaps you overlook some of the uh, fault. Uh, and now that we're, we're really experiencing the cracks of the system, now that we but this all comes from some decisions that happen uh, at that particular point. Uh, and, and so has led into the kind of corrupted uh, politics and um, uh, dissociation between the, uh, the people and the political structure that now we see in full force, right? It comes from the transition, really. And I think that the other thing you have to take into account when you talk about that period, particularly around the, the time of Franco's death, moving into 76, 77, before the Constitution, mm -hmm. It's, it's just the, the, um, the element of fear mm. and uncertainty. Yes. I know I don't look old enough, but I actually spent my year abroad in Spain, yes. 75, 76. Yes. So I mean, <laughs> you I, really I mean, you know, lived through it, yeah. and, and you could feel the fear, even from someone. I mean, in those days, we didn't have the kind of information that was that's available to people on the internet now. Basically, you know, if you get in a book, you didn't get it. Basically. Um, so even though I was doing my year abroad, um, I'm still relatively ignorant. About a lot of things, but the, the fear was tangible, yeah. and the uncertainty, and I and I think you know that is a kind of significant part of it. But I, I think what also <laughs> I think is almost curious now is that a lot of the, you know the, whole, the debates about the recovery of historical memory, the, the debates about the Spanish Civil War. But what's actually happened recently is that um, people aren't just arguing about the Civil War; they're now arguing about the way it was dealt with in the transition. Mm -hmm. like, you know, when, um, was it two or three years ago when Joaquin Laguna and Amo de la Grande is going to have a very public spat in the newspapers and it, and it drew in mm -hmm. you know, all sorts of people, Monroe Molina and, yes. uh, and things, and they're arguing you know, ferociously and bitterly, not about the war, 
but about the transition mm -hmm. and you know this, this it has become the new world ground right? and it's become and that in itself has become the battleground rather than the war itself mm -hmm. and so that the war becomes a kind of is pushed into the background um but i i actually i did want, want to ask a kind of question because i think um all the, the things you've been saying about context and the, and the way in which um you know certain questions just are not asked at certain times because the the kind of cultural context or the political context has changed and you know you're talking about the 70s where there was the cold war the 90s um where you're in the kind of post-soviet bloc um significantly the the development of all these associations in spain um the recovery of stockholm and these things they come from the late 90s onwards and yes. one of the main contexts for that is the development of the internet yes. basically which actually makes right. it possible right. mm -hmm. um but the other thing that people are starting to say as well, and I think it's probably back to about 2000, 2008, 2009, I think, Jose Carlos Miner said something recently, Santos Julia, talking about the commercialization of the Civil War. So all these novels that you talked about, you know, like Soldado de Salamina, right. and, I mean, there's been a host of novels since. I wonder if you've got any thoughts on, on that. Is there this danger of the commercialization of the Civil War through um, books? And cinema, yeah. and, and the kind of impact that that might be having on yeah. know, this whole process. Yeah, I, I think this is a, a whole another layer, um, um, but it's true um, that um, there is this um, this sort of um, consumer-driven narrative um, that is. Um, I, I, I think it's uh, very new, uh, very neutralizing. You know the uh, the, the real uh, the real. Uh, atrocities and the events have, have sort of uh, um, there's a, a certain retro aesthetic even um, that, that, that kind of feeds the nostalgia for the period and, and you can see that also now there is uh, telenovelas you know set uh, in the 1940s and, and in the 1950s particularly the, the beginning of, uh, of the dictatorship and, um, and and so it's just used as, a, as a, some sort of a setting yeah? Uh, to sell retro nostalgia. Yeah, the way we used to watch gangster movies. <laughs> yeah, there's a little bit of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you see it uh, all the time now in movies and, and television in particular. But also books. There's, there was this uh, this fate of um, republishing old books from the 1940s and 50s. You know, um, um, el, el pencil, el, el, el florido pencil, oh, all these uh, Franco's textbooks that are now being republished in full color for the nostalgia effect. And there's a whole section on bookstores, uh, some of uh, really bestsellers, you know, of oh, uh, laughing at our past, sort of. Sort of. But also, th there is that uh, attraction you know, for what is not longer there and uh, it's a uh, um, more the, innocent time. Yeah, but, well, but so the, it, it, it is a yeah. fake nostalgia, right? Because yeah. you're a fake. You're feeling nostalgia for something that never really existed, right? It's, it's nostalgia for nostalgia itself. It's restitution more than uh, yeah. for something that was never there, I think. Yeah. For something that was never there, exactly. And uh, I, I think that there is a very strong tendency to, towards that, as driven by market forces, really. Yeah. 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 Um, touching on that as well, what kind of uh, formal memorialization uh, is currently being uh, generated? Uh, is it just through civic uh, societies and uh, NGOs or is the state support for any formal kind of memorialisation uh, supported through uh, national museums or in the form of national uh, yeah. memorials? Mm. Um, well, um, as I was saying, uh, the, the biggest institutional uh, move in that direction was the, the passing of the 2007 yes. law of historical memory which has a, a number of measures uh, including um, well things uh, of the nature of uh, public spaces uh, that had any uh, sort of connection with the old regime you know street names or statues of franco all those things are legal now so the, that's a process of uh, dememorialization uh, for sure uh, happening throughout there was also the movement towards the recovery, the unearthing of mass graves. Uh, uh, there were uh, processes and, uh, and there were funds and, uh, involved in that, although uh, that has kind of uh, been put to a stop in, with the new government. Um, so those are the biggest institutional acts. Uh, um, there's no museum of the Spanish Civil War 
as, as such. Um, they're individual. But no monument. There's no erected. There's no would actually represent. But, and this is one of the things. There's so many monuments that represent the Franco side of it. Yes, we still have the monuments of Franco. We still have there is the Valley of the Fallen. We still have Belchite. We still have a, a lot of the. We have the museum of the side. Right, but that's a Catalan thing. It's not really uh, Spanish, is it? No, no, I think it's... Is it? Yeah. No, no, not only Catalan, yes. No. What, where is it? The Junquera? Yeah. Right. Oh, well, but I thought it was Catalan. No, I think it's more... It's, it's also not only Catalan, it's, it's Spanish. Perhaps you want to tell us a little bit about that? No, no, no. <laughs> just, just been there recently. No, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but I think it's... it's but but it's, it's, isn't it a, 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 a kind of ironic that it's a forgotten museum of memory? <laughs> <laughs> and where it is, and um, yeah. where you need to go through to in order to get there. Please tell us more. No, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe in your next book. Yes. <laughs> I really liked where you ended up in your paper with the memory without borders, justice without borders. But if we can go back to where you started right at the beginning with the Andreas Ferguson quote and the kind of ubiquity of memory. Mm -hmm. uh, with globalisation. And I'm thinking about Syria, and I'm thinking about people saying, these are crimes against humanity, we have evidence of it, we have memory, it's there. And I'm thinking about Guantanamo, when people are yes. saying, force feeding is against human rights and we have evidence of it, etc, etc. So we have our memories, mm -hmm. but it almost becomes a lack of accountability because it's so ubiquitous. You see, see what I mean? So I, I like I like the idea of where you end up, but I wonder I wonder whether it, it can actually happen. And we know how notorious kind of bringing cases of the Hague is, and how long they take, mm -hmm. and that the international community decides someone's a war criminal, but then, yes. however many decades later, they might get justice. So I'm, I don't I mean it's, it's it's a less academic question. It's more of a kind of just a general mm -hmm. where where can we go with this yeah. idea? Well, it's a long journey, I think, and we're not really uh, there. It's everything is still information to 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 a large extent, but uh, at the same time, one would have to ask our, our, ourselves, what what would the world be without a, this effort? Uh, you know, this grassroots efforts and this pressure um, that you, you you can see in you know in, in blogs and activists. Without that, uh, would be in the hands of. Um, uh, you know the great political structures that uh, are really not not uh, doing anything. So that's when this this uh, this new momentum. Uh, there is a possibility of at least um, you know sharing uh, these memories and, and uh, voicing them. Uh, whereas um, in the past perhaps that was not possible. So I, I think um, the the context has changed and uh, has shifted. And uh, there is now a possibility of at least, um, you know, giving voice to, to that. Uh, how long it would take for that to actually, convert, you know, con consolidate and, and conform, you know, uh, a universal jurisdiction, that's, uh, that's another question, of course. Yeah. There's also a, a, some sort of double standard because most of the, um, uh, most of the, the cases that have been uh, put on trial, so to speak, within Rwanda, or um, you know, or or, or in um, or in the old Yugoslavia, have been you know third world countries kind of, but none none of the big players have been really put on trial. You know, but Tana hasn't been put on, on trial. You know, it should, but it hasn't. Whereas we can look at Rwanda, we can look at other places, right? So I there is, structurally, I, I think there is a, some sort of double structure, um, double um, moral, so to speak, right? Yes, the, the, I think the, those are just the perhaps institutional asymmetries, right? It's, it's kind of the same irony, right? The Spanish judge can uh, can uh, try a, a Latin American dictator, but cannot <laughs> uh, deal with the big one at home, right? Well, if there are no other questions, I think we can wrap up. Thank you very much. Thank Jose once again for a very stimulating talk and for uh, coming to be with us. I think that's all of you for being here. Thanks. Thanks.